presenter have already joined in this room. Uh, so for the first, maybe Arleni, 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 Marika Sufi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Brian, Brianne, Brianne. Yes, that's right. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and then Tyler. Tyler, no, not yet. Uh, join. Uh, Ryan. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, David. Mm, no. Oye, Oye Dolapo. I'm here. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then uh, Mars, Elizabeth Mars. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I announced that uh, presentation time is uh, 10 minutes each, and uh, discussion will be uh, conducted after our presenter delivered. Uh, the presentation. Yeah. Uh, for all presenter and participant in this session, uh, you are welcome to ask question. Please uh, type your question in uh, Zoom chat and mention which presenter you want to ask. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Let me introduce myself. My name is Marika Sufi Amalia. I'm from Department of Nutrition Science, Universitas Diponegoro. And the honorable judges, committee, and all participants of the international conference on tropical and coastal region eco development. Thank you for the chance that given to me. And today I will present my research, and the title is Nutrition Education via Instagram and Motivational Interviewing for Weight Loss Motivation and Physical Activity in Obese Female Students. Next is an overview of the material, including introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion, and the last about conclusions. It's important to begin by saying that adequate physical activity is needed by humans to manage body health. However, the facts show that many people fail to meet the WHO's F activity recommendations. 33% of Indonesian people aged over 10 years have low physical activity and dominated by women. For 60% and 38% of medical students in Universitas Brawijaya and Universitas Udayana had low physical activities. The lack of physical activity can lead obesity, and other metabolic syndrome. Obesity increased threefold since 1975 to 2016 in worldwide. In Indonesia, the obesity rate on over 18 years tended to rise for 21% in 2018. Lack of knowledge and motivation about physical activity become an obstacle in implementation of healthy lifestyles. Nutrition education and motivational interviewing are methods to increase motivation as essential factors in increasing physical activity. So how to improve? Nutrition education provides information covering dietary and physical activity with balanced nutrition guidelines. It aims to influence the subject's behavior. Ease of access puts Instagram as an effective medium to deliver education. And the previous study on female adolescents showed that nutrition education based on Instagram and WhatsApp could significantly increase subject's nutrition knowledge. In line with the second method, Motivational interviewing is a collaborative discussion method between counselors and clients to strengthen motivation and commitment of subject. The previous study stated motivational interviewing for patients at risk of cardiovascular disease, increased working activities, decreased diastolic blood pressure, and decreased cholesterol levels. 
research that apply Instagram as nutrition educational media collaborated with the motivational interviewing are still limited. So, this study aim to discover the effects of nutrition education via Instagram with or without motivational interviewing for weight loss motivation and physical activity in obese female students. This study took place at Universitas Diponegoro Semarang with a quasi-experimental design and a pre-post control group design. The study was conducted from June to September 2019. The samples were active students aged 18 to 23 years, had obesity, and an active Instagram user. Subjects were divided into three groups. P1 was given nutrition education through Instagram for 30 days and motivational interviewing four times, and then P2 was given nutrition education via Instagram only. And the last, the control group, was given a leaflet. We use International Physical Activity Questionnaire, short form, or IPEC-SF, and Healthy Diet Motivation Questionnaire. And the statistical analysis, we use univariate and bivariate, that is ANOVA, uh, Kruskal Wallis, Perti, Tess, Wilcoxon, and Mendt Whitney. The characteristic of these study subjects uh, were 20 years old in average with a um, 28 mean of BMI and then 70% of subjects were from science and technology faculty, 70% resided in rented rooms and 56% had monthly allowance under 1 million rupiahs. The table shown that there was no significant difference of weight loss motivation in all groups. However, nutrition education via Instagram combines motivational interviewing, increasing weight loss motivation better than nutrition education via Instagram only. The increase in the K group is caused by useful information accepted from the leaflet. The table shown that there was a significant difference of total activity in all groups. This condition is caused by motivational interference to doing physical activity for subject. And the role of nutrition education provides adequate and repetitive information that enables the subject to increase their activity. The physical activity decreased in the K group due to the absence of monitoring. The table shown that there was a significant difference in moderate physical activities for all groups. Moderate activities include daily chores that easily apply to the subjects, and the types that conducted the subjects were washing clothes, sweeping, and mopping the floor. That ease of access to subjects in carrying out moderate activities caused a behavior change. Theory of Stimulus Organism Response, or SOR, explains that behavior change can be realized when the existing stimulus is received and can convince subjects, and therefore, attitude changes occur. Attitude changes that are supported by the environment will result in a behavior change. The last table show that the significant differences in the mean change of total and moderate physical activities were further tested using men with knee. The test results show that there were significant differences in the mean change in between the P1 and P2 group compared to the K group. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. To conclude, I would like to say Nutrition education through Instagram and motivational interviewing could increase the total physical activities that encourage weight loss in obese women. Thank you for listening attentively. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, thank you, Marika Sufi. Thank you, ma'am.
<laughs> yeah, nice presentation. Uh, and for the third uh, presenter, I invite uh, Brianna. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Time and uh, screen are yours. Okay. Can everyone see? Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, staying. We know it's late for many of you. <laughs> it's uh, early for us in the Boston area, but uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present. So my presentation, well, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Brianne Langlois, and I'm a PhD student at Tufts University um, in Nutrition Epide Epidemiology and Data Science. And my presentation is about flood-related vulnerability assessment using a spatial index uh, with principal component analysis. And this is part of the collab US-Indonesian grant funded by the US National Science Foundation. So why are we interested in flood vulnerability? Well, as extreme flooding events continue, it's important to identify communities that are most vulnerable in order to aid disaster preparation and mitigation efforts. But also, um, also, these methods can be applied in other contexts around the world. So there are several methodological approaches for vulnerability assessment, and part of my research is focused on exploring those methods and evaluating them, and also um, looking at the food security and nutrition related aspects of vulnerability. So as part of this project, a group of Tufts University students this past summer from May to August of 2020 identified and gathered various publicly available data sources that can be used to assess climate vulnerability in central Java. So these, this was not primary data collection, but rather we identified various data sources that included GIS, remote sensing, survey data, and available uh, disaster data. So it's important to identify or define vulnerability in this context so I just want to draw on this definition from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they defined vulnerability in terms of exposure to natural hazards and also sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So theoretically, a vulnerability index should encompass all three of these components. However, that is challenging uh, for our work because it requires multiple data sources. So in for this project, um, I also included the general aims of my research, which are to identify and explore how publicly available data sources can be used for climate vulnerability assessment, and also to develop and evaluate a vulnerability metric that describes exposures to effects of and ability to adapt to flood events. Um, and also, as I mentioned previously, I'm interested in specifically the food security aspects of vulnerability. For this presentation specifically, I am exploring a principal component analysis approach for driving a spatial vulnerability index using flood events data that were obtained from the Indonesian National Board for Disaster Management. So principal component analysis is an exploratory data-driven approach, meaning that there's no a priori hypothesis applied to the data. So this yeah. is based on Oh, okay. <laughs> the exploratory uh, approach is based on data that we could find. Um, we're basically just letting the data speak for itself. Um, so as I mentioned, the data was from the Indonesian National Board for Disaster Management, and it was aggregated by districts. So this data was at the level of flood events, and then we aggregated it by district. There was no sub-district level information, so we um, analyzed the data by district, and the variables were log or square root transformed prior to analysis, and all analysis and visualizations were done, and also ArcMap. So a little bit about this data source. Um, it included data on flood events um, from 1968 to 2019. 
And I don't know about the data quality, but, um, but that was the table. And so on the right are just a list of the variables that were available in this data source and that I included in this principal component analysis. So as you can see, we had the number of floods, the number of deaths, number of people evacuated, those indirectly affected, the number of people injured, and then also variables on total damages to crops, roads, houses, um, and houses destroyed and inundated. So this map shows the total number of flood events by district across central Java province. In total, the database recorded 1,469 floods during that time period, most were caused by heavy or torrential rainfall. So this plot shows the results of the principal component analysis. Sorry if the font is a little small, but these are called scree plots. And on the top, um, we have the eigenvalues by each of the components that were derived from the analysis on the x-axis. And on the bottom, we have the percent of variance explained by each of the components. So generally speaking, eigenvalues less than one mean that the component is not important. So as we can see from the top graph, only the first three components had eigenvalues greater considered meaningful or important. Um, it shows that the first principal component explained only about 46% of the total variation in the data, followed by 15% in the second principal component and even less in the following principal components. So this uh, table on the left shows basically how we can characterize each of the factor or principal components um, by each, uh, each of the numbers in the cells represent the correlation of that variable to that specific factor or component. So what I did was just circle in red the ones that are, have the stronger correlations, and that tells us how each component is characterized. So for example, the first one is strongly characterized by the number of people that were evacuated, the damage, in, the damage uh, total damages in terms of the crops, and the number of people that were indirectly affected and the number of inundated houses, and also to a lesser extent, the number of floods. The figure on the right shows the contribution of each variable to principal components one and two. So you can see there the number of floods, damages to crops again come out as uh, strong contributors to the components. And the districts are also represented in this graph in terms of their relationship to the axes. And you can see at the top right, Kilikop, and at the bottom, Patti kind of come out as most vulnerable according to these metrics. So this map is just showing the results of the first principal component, which explains 46 of the variation of the data. And it's telling us the higher scores for this component mean uh, more vulnerable. So this is telling us the district that came out less vulnerable according to this data and those that came out more vulnerable. So Kili Kap and Pati are highlighted as those in the highest, uh, highest score of this variable. And the districts in the middle came out uh, with a lesser score. So principal component analysis is a common approach to climate vulnerability assessment, but it does have limitations. Uh, further ground truthing and mapping are needed to validate and identify appropriate variables. This was sort of just an exploration based on the data that we had avail available. Um, but the next steps for this project include assessing other combinations of variables, trying to disaggregate below the district level, and also using other data sources such as the Dartmouth flood observatory data and also Copernicus remote sensing data. Um, and also I'm exploring other methods of creating vulnerability indices. Um, and then also we plan to evaluate these indices by modeling the relationship with other health, nutrition, and socioeconomic outcomes, and also through community perceptions and using other data sources. So one of the other data sources we're planning to work with is the Indonesian Family Life Survey. And I would just like to acknowledge my co-authors and 
Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Brianna. Mm, nice presentation. Yeah. Okay, uh, for the next uh, presenter, I invite uh, Tyler. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Stotland and I'm an undergraduate student um, in the programs of environmental studies and community health at Tufts University. And today I will discuss a kernel density and space time analysis of flood events in Indonesia from 1985 to 2020. And I'm part of Bree's team um, and this research is part of a collaborative uh, US Indonesian research grant on the sustainable adaptation of coastal areas to environmental change. Um, oh, there we go. So there's a few reasons why understanding um, flooding in Indonesia is important from a spatio-temporal perspective. So first of all, cities like Samarang um, have changed ge geologically over time in a way that um, makes these cities particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. So for example, in Samarang, according to the resilient Samarang report through the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, historically the coastline of Samarang was four kilometers inland from the current coastline and the city expanded outwards due to increased sedimentation. And so now the city is this, in this very coastal area and thus um, vulnerable to sea level rise which presents an urgent flooding risk in Indonesia, particularly in the central Java region. And so pulling this together, it's necessary to study and predict the spatiotemporal nature of flooding events to strengthen climate change resilience planning in high density population centers. The objective of this research is to analyze flood data from 1985 to 2020, to identify the spatial density of flooding in Indonesia, and to identify potential emerging hotspots of flooding events. So the methods for this research began with obtaining data from the Dartmouth Flood Observatory. And so the data initially was, was obtained as a GIS layer showing all of the flood events in Indonesia during this time interval, 1985 to 2020. And the GIS layer was a polygon layer. So each polygon was, a, was showing the geographic area over which a flood event happened. And so, this, this is very interesting data, but it's not, it wasn't initially conducive to the types of analysis that we were interested in. So the polygons were converted to a point layer by identifying the centroids, the center points of each flood polygon. And then this point layer in GIS software um, was used to run a kernel density analysis to find the spatial density or the clusters geographically of flood events. And then next in emerging hotspot analysis was conducted from the point layer to better understand how time and the spatial factors um, combined to um, show different trends in flooding events over this interval. So the results of um, this of these methods are shown in the map here where we can see that the, the shades of blue, the blue gradient shows the kernel density results here in the map. The yellow boxes that you can see in West and Central Java show emerging hotspot results where there are statistically significant sporadic hotspots. And then finally, the green dots are each of the flood events. So that's the point layer that I mentioned that was extracted from the initial Dartmouth Flood Observatory data. So the conclusions that we can draw from these results um, are first that the spatial distribution of flood events was most concentrated in West and Central Java, where we can see um, up to 0 0.04 floods per hectare in the cluster center. Next, we can see that there are also lesser flood event clusters in Gorontalo, North Sumatra, 
Asa, West Sumatra, and Rio provinces. I apologize for pronouncing those um, incorrectly. And uh, the West and Central Java cluster, most interestingly, is an area where we see both high results in the kernel density analysis, and we also see sporadic hotspots. So that brings me to my conclusions, where we can see from the map that the West and Central Java provinces are the only region where we see significance um, spatiotemporally. So there is significance in both the kernel density and the emerging hotspot models. So in other words, there's significant vulnerability to flooding over this time interval and perhaps into the future um, to flooding due to climate change and um, other climatic factors. So there's future research needed to clarify the association between these identified sporadic hotspots and climate change. And there's also future research needed to adapt these findings into climate change resilience goals. So Samarang already, I know, already has very impressive climate change policy um, and plans and resilient Samarang, that report is also very impressive. Um, but of course, there's always more, more climate change resilience planning needed going forward. And especially there's work needed to understand the intersection of these flood vulnerable areas and population centers so that places with the highest population of, of people prone to flooding um, can be best prepared. So I'd like to acknowledge all these people for their collaboration and assistance and mentorship in this research. Um, and I'd like to um, also acknowledge that the research was funded by the Tufts Institute of the Environment and the National Science Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Okay, for the next presenter, uh, Ryan, are you ready to present? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so I will share my screen. Wonderful. And we can start. So, Salamu Alaikum. My name is Ryan Simpson. I'm a PhD candidate from the Tufts Friedman School, um, also in the Nutritional Epidemiology and Data Science Department. And today I'll be speaking to you about a project I'm working on as part of this group uh, in coastal flooding vulnerability and COVID 19 outbreak severity, specifically looking at the central Java province or the Jawa Tenga province in Indonesia. Um, so, my project is rooted in kind of this idea that for coastal communities, um, they are susceptible to seasonal flooding, and that seasonal flooding can obviously result in the destruction of urban infrastructure, or more so the disruption of urban in infrastructure, specifically focusing on amplification of risk for waterborne diseases. Um, obviously, in the case of COVID-19, um, we have other additional serious concerns and challenges that we're trying to identify. And in the case of a seasonal flooding or an extreme flooding event, weakened infrastructure can result in weakened health infrastructure, which can impair the ability for monitoring, tracking, and treating of the current COVID-19 outbreak. So one of the things that I've been focusing on as part of this research group uh, with a background more in infectious diseases is thinking about ways in which climate change and specifically coastal flood flooding can influence our ability to treat the current COVID outbreak uh, in the Jawa Tenga province of Indonesia. Um, specifically, my work is focused on exploring associations between SARS-CoV-2 infection rates and flooding severity within the six codas and 29 regencies of Jawa Tenga, um, focusing on a specific uh, narrowed time interval from the 17th of March to the 1st of October as date as the days go by and, and data continues to become available, um, predominantly from the John Hopkins, uh, uh, I guess, data repository for COVID-19 cases, um, I'll continue to try to update this and continue to update the time frame as, as we move forward. Um, but right now, as of, uh, as of today, I have up through the 1st of October. Um, and predominantly, my aims are twofold. So first is to describe differences in rates of COVID infection between coastal and non-coastal communities to evaluate and see whether coastal communities may be more susceptible to COVID infection than non-coastal communities. Uh, and second would be to explain spatial temporal associations between outbreak onset and 
flood event timing, as well as between outbreak peak intensity and flood severity. Uh, and this is in part tied with the previous work uh, discussed by Tyler and Bree, thinking about ways in which coastal flooding and flooding severity can be evaluated through the vulnerability index that they're producing, and looking at relationships between this vulnerability index and the outbreak onset and flooding, uh, or I'm sorry, the outbreak onset and its severity in relation. So you can see in the, the image in the bottom is actually from the uh, Jawa Tenga province uh, coronavirus data uh, repository. And we can see that um, the red cases are cases of individuals who have been treated. Green cases are those who have been recovered and black uh, dots, I guess, are cases of individuals who have died. So we can see that there is somewhat, at least from a visual standpoint, there seems to be a clustering of, of cases around the uh, coastal areas. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to explore that in further depth moving forward with this project. Um, the data that I intend to use is uh, predominantly being extracted um, as a time reference data set, so a time series data set for COVID-19 cases, deaths, treated persons, and healed persons per coder and regency using this Java Tenga uh, uh, webpage, I guess the data repository that's available. Um, this was provided to me by um, my co-authors, which I greatly appreciate their support in being able to find this data as it has been quite difficult to find. Um, and Predominantly right now, our approach is to use a non-parametric Comograph Zerbenkel filter, uh, which is used to estimate the onset and peak timing of COVID outbreaks. So this filter is one that we have actually been applying in uh, ongoing research on the COVID-19 outbreak in Massachusetts in the United States. Um, and we've been using it to identify a day of the week effect where we've found that for uh, weekends as compared to weekdays, there tends to be a lower rate of uh, reported COVID cases and deaths. And so what we've been working on so far is using this filter to filter out that day of the week effect and then apply this non-parametric filter on top of this, uh, I guess, smooth data set uh, and being able to then from that extract derivatives, which indicate exactly when the onset occurred, when the peak timing may have occurred, and if a recovery has occurred yet, then the recovery as well from from the infectious disease outbreak. And so by being able to extract those specific time points, we can then use those time points and the rates of change of infection during those time points or those periods to be able to compare how rates of acceleration or deceleration may have changed in relationship to the flooding event data that we also have from um, obviously our partners from the Thai grants, so Bree, Tyler, David, et cetera. Um, with that said, the flooding data source that we'll be using is the same as what um, has been already stated by the research group. We'll be using the Indonesian National Board for Disaster Management uh, to evaluate specifically in my case, uh, flood timing and intensity. And then ideally being able to use the index that is being created um, by the team and specifically uh, indicators related to the timing and severity of the actual flooding events. And for specifically coastal communities, evaluating relationships between the intensity of rates of different case definitions and then the intensity of actual flooding events themselves. Um, so some of the key research highlights so far is that um, it's been a slow process. Preliminary results are, are minimal at the moment um, and that's predominantly because of the uh, difficulty in the aggregation and alignment of the time series data sets from multiple sources. Um, Obviously, I'm not necessarily a native speaker, so being able to translate things has been um, slightly a slower process, um, and specifically finding time reference data sets, because most of the data that I find uh, currently has been in kind of the form that we see in this graphic here, where it does provide you the breakdown of the different uh, cases per province or by coda, but it doesn't necessarily provide a time series for which that data is available. So being able to find time referenced uh, health records has been um, somewhat of a challenge, and then obviously once having those counts, um, being able to then convert them into rates where it's uh, adjusted by the population of each of the codas and regencies has been also a challenge and being able to find that demographic data. Um, so if there are any um, folks who are, who are listening who actually have uh, greater information on where to find some of that data, I would be greatly appreciative. Um, what I can say is from preliminary results, we see that Semarang Kota, Semarang Regency, and the Japara Regency have the highest counts, again, not necessarily rates, but the highest counts of COVID cases in, in each of these areas are coastal communities. 
And moving forward, our goal will be to continue extracting the time reference data to the best of our abilities based on how much data we are able to extract, either undergo spatial temporal analyses or just simply draw a descriptive comparisons by cases, deaths, treated persons, and recovered persons. And then moving forward, we'll ideally try to expand this type of analysis for both foodborne and, and waterborne illnesses, in addition to COVID, um, if we can have access or at least find access to that, that sort of a data. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge the group from um, the Thai Research Group. I'd also like to give a, a special thanks to um, Dr. Ambarianto Abarianto, Dr. Uh, Yulianto Prab. Uh, Dr. Agus uh, Suandano, um, and Dr. Elena Namova. Um, again, apologies for any of the mispronunciations there. Um, and thank you to both Ty and the NSF IRIS grant um, for the funding. So thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, uh, and uh, for the presenter, I announced that uh, it would be, uh, uh, there are, uh, what what we call it, uh, we will choose uh, the best presenter for uh, this session. <laughs> Maybe after a uh, question and answer uh, session. After Ryan, uh, I will invite uh, David, are you ready? To present, yeah. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to start my slideshow. Um, okay. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is David Carroll. And uh, um, let me just, okay, sorry, one second. Um, does this work? Does the, the can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so my presentation is on flooding impacts on mangrove ecosystems, marine fisheries, and coastal communities in uh, Jawa Tenga province in Indonesia. And I'm part of the same research group that um, Ryan and Tyler and Brian had already explained. It's the U.S. Indonesian Research Experience for Students on sustainable adaptation of coastal areas to environmental change. And so some of the background information is similar to what the other presenters have already discussed. So I will do this very quickly. Um, as uh, was mentioned already previously, um, the Jawatenga province is prone to flooding due to geological changes, um, tidal inundation, land subsidence, um, river overflow, and then another phenomenon, which is sea level rise from climate change. Um, and I'm looking at how this, these phenomenon um, impact coastal ecosystems, uh, specifically mangrove forests. And um, this uh, severe seasonal flooding can have a impact on mangrove ecosystems, um, along with other impacts caused from changes in land use. and um, yeah, basically changes in land use. And these impacts can have, an in, can have an effect on coastal fisheries as well, and on the livelihoods of coastal communities that depend partly on fishing for their economic sustenance. Um, and so the aims are to look at the interactions between mangrove destruction or loss of mangrove forest, um, flooding events, sea level rise from climate change, um, impacts on fisheries and the livelihoods in coastal communities. And I chose the Demak and Samaran Regencies. Um, Demak is where most of the mangrove forests close to Samarang City are located. Um, and the specific aims are to characterize how the trends in the change in mangrove forest um, from 2000 to 2020, and then to explain the associations between mangrove forest change and flooding risk. Um, also to explain the associations between flooding risk and the health of uh, marine fisheries in the Bay of Semarang. And then lastly, to determine the impacts of these events um, on coastal ecosystems and fisheries and to see how this is affecting the food security and human development outcomes in coastal communities in this area. 
And the methodological approach is for the first specific aim is to characterize mangrove health and change using a change detection analysis of remote sensing data and GIS data. Um, and I did this first using um, Copernicus land cover global land um, service data. And this is from the European Union. Um, and I use two different types of data. They have land cover classes and they also have NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index is a way to determine um, the greenness or the vigor and the health of vegetation on the landscape. And after doing the change detection, um, uh, the Copernicus data is only available from 2015 to 20. Doing this change detection, I will expect the band characteristics of mangrove forests in a Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. And we'll use this to classify uh, mangrove forest from satellite images from earlier years, for example, 2000 to 2020. And in this way, the change detection can be applied for a longer time period. And after doing this, um, we'll look at associations between flooding risk and mangrove health using Brie, um, Ms. Brie Langlois, um, Langlois vulnerability metric. And uh, after this, the next specific aim, we will look at association between flooding risk and fisheries productivity. And there are multiple ways to do this. One is using remote sensing satellite imagery data to look at um, chlorophyll content and um, uh, sediment, dissolved sediments in the coastal waters to evaluate the, um, the quality of the waters for fisheries productivity. And also looking at fishing vessel data from the Global Fishing Watch and from the Indonesian government. Um, to look at where she is occurring most uh, intensively in the Bay, Bay of Samarang. And lastly, I will use um, household, household survey data from Indonesia Family Life Survey and um, demographic and health survey data from the US government and the Indonesian government, um, specifically focusing on DEMAK uh, Regency who evaluate how um, socioeconomic outcomes have changed over time in response to increased flooding risk. And these are preliminary results. Um, this study just began recently, so the full results are not yet available, but this is a change detection performed on Copernicus land service land cover data. And this is only the forest class of data. You can see the red represents a change um, a, a loss of forest cover between 2015 and 2020. And the green represents a increase in forest cover. And this area in yellow is Demak. Um, this is the coastal region where mangrove forests are located. You can see that there is a significant loss of mangroves, but also there is some green area, which means there was a um, increase in mangrove forest in some areas. And the gray is areas that did not change. Um, this is a different change detection analysis of normalized difference vegetation index. So this does not show forest loss. It shows um, reduction or increase in vegetative health and vigor. And in the same area of coastal Demac Regency, you can see um, the red shows areas where vegetative health has declined. And the green shows areas where the vegetative health has increased between October 2014 and October 2020. And moving forward, the future directions for this research will involve extracting the spectral reflectance profile of mangrove forest on Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2 imagery in the same area that I showed you with in the small yellow circle in Demac Regency where the mangrove forests are located. And after doing this, I'll use this re reflectance profile to classify mangrove forest on uh, Landsat and Sentinel data from 2000 to 2020 using supervised and unsupervised classification techniques and comparing these two techniques. And after that, we will use classified imagery to conduct change detection over this 20 year period. And after that, we will, using uh, results from collaborators on this project, we'll develop a spatial model to detect association between mangrove abrasion and increased flooding risk. And we'll use data from the Indonesia Family Life Survey 
to examine the impacts of increased flooding risk and mangrove abrasion on socioeconomic outcomes in coastal fishing communities of Semarang and Demak, um, and also investigate available data on fisheries, including fish, uh, fishing vessel activity from the um, data from the Indonesian government. And I would like to acknowledge the collaborators on this program. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. <laughs> and uh, we still have two, two presenters. Uh, Oye Dolapo. Yeah, I'm here. I'm yeah. going to share my screen right away. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, I know it's kind of getting late for you over there. So I'll try to be, um, to get through this as fast as I can. Um, my name is Dolako. I am a third year doctoral student in the Nutrition Interventions, Communication and Behavior Change Track at um, South um, Friedman School. And in this presentation, I'll be sharing with you the preliminary results of my exploration of the dietary data in the Indonesian Family Life Survey um, with five data sets, um, specifically looking at determinants of higher consumption of Western dietary patterns among Indonesians 15 years and older. I'm conducting this um, analysis as part of my doctoral dissertation work, which is focused on assessing the relationship between diet quality and um, cardiovascular disease risk factors in Indonesia, specifically focusing on hypertension and obesity. So um, the presentation will give you a brief background and context to this topic and the gaps I'll be addressing. I'll walk you through the methods and present some preliminary results and talk to you about the future directions. So westernization and nutrition transitions contribute to environmental pollution through increasing man-made marine debris and plastification of the oceans which is threatening marine life. Marine pollution from microplastics threatens fish availability and quality. For Indonesia, fish is a major nutrient of importance because it's a main source of protein. It's a major source of omega-3 fatty acid, which is an important nutrient in reducing CVD risk. And although Indonesia commits to uh, preventing and significantly reducing marine pollution of all kinds. Indonesia still ranks second globally for bad, bad management of man-made marine debris after China. And health fallout from nutrition transitions are enormous, generating concern for policymakers. So, um, Gaps to be addressed, few studies have um, assessed population characteristics that are associated with higher consumption of the Western dietary pattern in Indonesia. And the literature is sparse on the impact of environmental contamination on food security and quality. And my specific aim in this exploration is to examine the association between the Western, higher consumption of Western dietary patterns in the IFLS5 and the respondents' social demographic, behavioral, and health factors. But for this presentation, I'm just um, presenting the preliminary results for the social um, demographic factors. So in terms of my methods, uh, I derived dietary patterns and examined the association between the derived patterns in, in the data set and the respondents um, factors. So the with five data uniquely captured dietary data of unhealthy food types, such as fast food, soft drinks, sweet snacks, and fried snacks, in addition to other food types. 
The survey instrument used was a brief food screener. <clears throat> Respondents about over 30,000 were asked if they consumed um, the foods listed in the past seven days. And I then derived dietary patterns using exploratory factor analysis. It's a method pretty similar to what Brie um, described in the in our presentation. Uh, factor analysis helps us to determine the correlation among each food item weighted by the, their consumption frequency scores. And the number of factors that I retained was determined by the script of egging values, magnitude of factor loadings, the interpretability of the factors and current literature on the derived patterns. So the 17 food items on the survey were entered into the factor analysis. And then I assessed the association between quintiles of consumption of each derived pattern and respondent characteristics. So um, this table shows the um, frequency of food consumption during the past seven days. And this, the, on the left, on the food type, you have all the food types listed in the food screener. And um, the highlighted foods are the ones that were most frequently consumed by respondents in the, in the past seven days. Um, other food types such as um, that typically um, describe Western type diet like fast food, soft drink, um, high intake of fish, uh, oh, sorry, of meat, and instant noodle and so on were kind of relatively um, less frequently consumed overall. And so the factor analysis um, returned three, loaded heavily on three um, types of food of um, patterns. The, the, fact, the first factor loaded heavily on um, instant noodle, soft drink, egg, sweet snack, fast food, and meat, and fried snack, and I tagged this Western pattern. And then the second factor loaded heavily on fruits and vegetables and I added fruit and vegetable pattern. And then the third factor loaded heavily on fish, leafy vegetables, sambal and rice. And I tagged it on um, traditional pattern. So overall, uh, more respondents reported having eaten the traditional pattern in the past, in the, yeah, in the past seven days when the um, survey was conducted. So focusing more specifically on the Western dietary pattern itself, um, men had higher consumption than women, um, consuming 52% of them were consuming in quintile five versus 43% consuming in quintile one. Whereas the women um, higher number were consuming in quintile one, 57% compared to 48% of uh, of them in quintile five. And then the younger participants, 15 to 24 years, year olds were um, compared to older participants and they had higher relative consumption of the Western pattern, um, consuming at 28% in the higher quintile compared to 8% in quintile one, whereas the older participants um, had 14% of them con consuming in quintile one versus 3% in um, quintile five. And then smokers compared to non-smokers also had higher consumption. And um, people with obesity compared to um, people with normal weight reported um, higher consumption of a Western dietary pattern. And so my conclusion is that these um, subgroups, men, younger adults, smokers, and people with higher weight status may benefit from nutrition interventions to promote lower consumption of Western um, style diets. Um, Western style, um, this is a concern because Western style, style diets have been shown in the literature to increase, um, to increase CVD risk factors. So in terms of future direction, I plan to further explore key disparities in each of the other dietary patterns among the um, populations of 
um, subgroups and then see how these patterns are associated with um, the respondents' health outcomes. And then also as part of my um, doctoral work, I'll, I'll be conducting a formative research to better understand the factors that are related to dietary behavior and their impact on the environment and health outcomes from a social ecological perspective. And then from there to write a grant proposal to fund a behavior change intervention study to prevent diet related chronic diseases among vulnerable populations in Indonesia. And yeah, I'll be seeking collaboration and networking opportunities among researchers in relevant fields to de design and implement such a study. And with that, I want to acknowledge all my collaborators in this study. And I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dolapo. Yeah, for the last presenter, I invite Elizabeth Mark. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, thanks. I will just share my screen. Yeah, okay. Oh my gosh. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Marsh and I am also working with the team that has just presented at the Friedman School at Tufts University. I'm a urban planning and epidemiology master's student and uh, this project that I'm gonna present on is called Climate Change Resilience Plan Operationalization in Cities, um, Evaluating Plans Long Range Impact in Boston and Semarang. I just want to start by by acknowledging our collaborators in Indonesia, especially thanking Wiwi Andri Handayani and Intan Hapsari Surya Putri. They've helped so much in this project. And I also want to acknowledge that my project in particular is really taking a broader view of what my colleagues have just presented. A lot of them have talked about the specific measurable problems that climate change is already happening um, in Indonesia. Um, and this is really taking a step back and looking at what are the existing plans and policies that are addressing um, these climate change disasters and upcoming issues and how are they working? How can we evaluate them? So climate change policy approaches have evolved from initially strategies of mitigation um, where we were just trying to um, prevent things like flooding. Um, and then policymaking researchers realized that uh, climate change was happening and so we are going to have to adapt. So research shifted towards adaptation. Uh, and finally, now the main focus of climate change policy is resilience planning. So um, a project that looked at 100 resilient cities funded by the Rockefeller Foundation around 2016 uh, defines resilience as urban resilience as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. And so this is thinking about resilience and climate policy at a city approach. And while climate change is a worldwide problem, I think that cities in unique places um, to innovative hubs to test policies that may be applicable at higher policy levels. So in this project, I compare uh, Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, and Semarang in Central Java, Indonesia. Um, both cities are surprisingly similar uh, and of course different. So they're similar uh, because they're both mid-sized coastal cities who are experiencing 
uh, resilient stresses such as coastal flooding, pollution, and waste. And also both cities were given funding from the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities Project between 2013 and 2016 um, to address these stresses. So we hope that by comparing these two cities, one from the global north and the other from the global south, that each city can learn from each other. So as I said, um, around 2013 to 2016, uh, these resilient cities plans were made. And here's a photo of the resilient Semarang plan. Um, and then parts of this plan were put into policy, into local policy, specifically in Semarang. And so here's just a photo of the budget for Semarang for 2016. And what still missing is um, what are the outcomes of these policies and can we measure them? And while there's sort of a gap in literature of the outcome of policy, I want to mention that one of our collaborators, Wiwi Handayani, um, has published a really fantastic paper that does look at this. And her paper is called Operationalizing Resilience, a Content Analysis of Flood Disaster Planning in Two Coastal Cities in Central Java. And we draw inspiration from her work in this project. So to reach our goal of measuring policy outcomes, we will first conduct a literature review to determine the current methods that are used to address plan quality. And so of course a plan is different than a policy. Uh, and so we will also look at literature methods to address policy outcomes and metrics. So from that, we will identify key indicators that can be compared between Semarang and Austin. We'll quantify and compare these indicators. Uh, and one method to compare these is comparing budget spending. Uh, and lastly, we'll suggest future indicators or methods to evaluate policy impact. So our preliminary results show that uh, Semarang actually spends more of its total budget on climate programs than Boston. And uh, spending in Semarang is pretty constant. Um, although in the bottom right graph, you can see that it does vary as a percent of the total budget. Um, and climate spending in Boston varies highly by year. So for people in Boston, it's very unpredictable uh, what funding there will be for climate programs. Uh, lastly, top left graph shows just overall spending in US dollars and Semarang in the past four, five years uh, has spent more in US dollars on flood mitigation, infrastructure and pollution and waste management uh, at the city level than Boston. So the differences between Semarang and Boston spending may be due to increased political willingness in Semarang to address um, resilience issues. And it may also be due to increased daily experience of climactic changes such as flooding in Semarang. And also experiences some flooding. I think that overall uh, Semarang is experiencing uh, more severe flooding than Boston. Uh, so a challenge in the methodology of this is that we are using the 100 Resilient Cities plans um, as a jumping off point to compare final policy outcome and then final indicators. And the 100 Resilient Cities plans have a very broad definition of resilience, so it may not be totally fair uh, to compare the specific climate change indicators between the city because the Boston plan had a much greater focus on social resilience. So my next, next steps in this project are to incorporate um, sustainable transportation policy and analyze spending on transportation between the two cities. And then lastly, to investigate the social resilience policy and spending aspect of resilience in both cities to have a broader picture of, uh, you know, the, the broader picture of resilience in both cities. Um, lastly, I would just like to say that um, what we found preliminarily is that 
um, there are some metrics within the budgets and within the policies in city, but these metrics don't really suffice to measure the true um, impact of these plans. And so this remains a gap uh, in the current policy and budgeting is really trying is really ways that are publicly available and transparent through city government to measure the work of the city government on these policies. And so I think that's a really important next step in city climate change policy for cities across the world is standardizing and understanding metrics to measure um, outcomes of climate change policy. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, Elizabeth is uh, the, uh, the last presenter, so, uh, now we enter to the uh, question and answer session. Uh, I don't see any question in the chat room. Maybe uh, I invite uh, uh, the, part, the participant to, to raise hand uh, and uh, directly ask maybe. Is there any question for the eight presenters? Miss Diana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, there are questions. Yeah, from uh, Mr. Chandrasa. Mr. Oh, yeah, Chandrasa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, okay. you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you want to ask directly, Mr. Chandrasa? Mr. Chandrasa. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can ask directly to Ryan. Oh yes, uh, to Mr. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you hear my voice? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I oh, okay, okay. Uh, so uh, I forgot in the in your research presented earlier. Do you consider both north and south coastal area in Central Java or Jawa Tengah, uh, and how far inland from the coast did the people in the coastal area will be vulnerable from both the effect of the coastal flood and COVID? Uh, and are there any vulnerability classifications? Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, and, and I actually appreciate you uh, asking this because I'm, I'm still very much early on in the phase of trying to aggregate all of the data. So in terms of next steps of, of the analysis phase, um, I think we would definitely consider both the northern and the southern coastal area for, for Jawatenga. I think in terms of how far inland we would we would consider is really contingent upon actually the work of the larger group. I think what we're really focused on right now is figuring out this flooding uh, vulnerability index. And part of that I presume would be also how far inland um, flooding may extend to be. So I think that flooding vulnerability index and the vulnerability classifications is something that as a group is, is being developed and predominantly being developed by my colleagues. Um, and then I would kind of be considering how that might affect the data moving forward, um, and and actually, it wasn't something that I had I had thought about um, as of yet. So thank you for bringing that up because I think that's that's obviously a very important uh, aspect of the flooding and COVID that will have to be addressed. Um, and if anyone else from the Thai team has um, further input that they'd like to put in about the vulnerability classifications, please feel free. Thank you. Oh yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, maybe one or two more questions. I have uh, yeah. one question. Yeah, Mr. Hemi. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my question is for uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm not follow all of uh, your presentation, but I think 80% uh, uh, of your presentation I can follow and uh, very interesting for uh, me, especially how you can compare resilient in Samarang and Boston. That is a good idea. <clears throat> and I think uh, it will be very important also for our local government. So we are waiting for your uh, uh, result. Yeah? And my question is related to the indicator of adaptation. Samarang have quite strong adaptation related to the tidal flood. 
So they have a very strong in this part. Is it include ding also on your indicator to compare both of them? I mean, the Samarang and Boston. And uh, because uh, in Samarang, uh, the people in Samarang is uh, live, uh, uh, think that the flooding is very common for uh, them. And they can't uh, doing many things, make adaptation and so on. So I think that is uh, the important thing to compare between Samarang and, and Boston, because in Samarang, uh, they have uh, the people, the local people have a very strong adaptation and I don't know, in, 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 in Boston. Yeah? And uh, second, uh, your matric, I think is uh, very important. Could you mind to a little bit uh, uh, explain again, I mean, a uh, little bit uh, related to your mat matric that you have? and also related to the gap uh, between the current policy and budgeting that you have. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your question. Um, I do want to start by saying I am so impressed by the spending and like depth and breadth of the policies in uh, Samung to address flooding. They really are quite comprehensive. Um, and um, just there's more than in Boston. Um, I, for this, I have just started by looking at the city budget of Semarang and, and of Boston. And so, uh, so that's a limited view. Uh, like there are more projects uh, going on in Semarang uh, than just the, the city budget. Um, but so, so, and that's something I want to learn about more, but, but just comparing the city budgets, um, we, I, I'm going to next look at the um, indicators, the, the metrics that are in the Semarang city budget that show the outcomes. Um, and, but what I found so far is that they're very general and um, Sometimes they're even projected. They're not like true uh, measurements. So, so I have found so far just by looking in the budget that um, there's not sufficient metrics to uh, measure um, the like programs of flood mitigation. Um, but I do want to say that um, Intan, I think she's here, uh, and we we have helped so much in. Um, helping us understand the Semarang budget because it's all in Bahasa. Um, and so, so I'm a little nervous to say exactly what indicators are there and not there because I think I need to do a little bit more research. So, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, I think um, basically just from looking at the city budget and the compared to Boston, Semarang is spending a lot more um, but the, the metrics, the indicators are not sufficient enough for the public to know exactly what's happening and the progress being made. Does that help or do you have any other bit of your question that I could help answer? Yes, the last one about the adaptation. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so I'm not exactly sure. I can show you, um, like my graph of overall spending on adaptation. And I know that there has been a lot of spending on flood mitigation uh, efforts in Semarang, um, much more than in Boston, um, but I don't have the metrics with me right now. Okay, yes, I think uh, that's a clear answer. Thanks. I yes. we can follow up and talk more in the future. Yes. 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 Thank Great. you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth and uh, Mr. Helmi. Maybe one more question for this session. Or maybe I have one question for Marika Sufi. You still in this room? Yes. Marika, 
uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for Marika, why you choose uh, Instagram, uh, not uh, uh, the other uh, other social media, Facebook maybe or uh, Vine? Okay, uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, so I think of for my research, why Instagram? Because uh, Instagram is a uh, second popular media sosial uh, after Facebook and then uh, in uh, according to Rahman AA et al at 20, uh, 2015 he said that in his in his research say that uh, the highest the highest users of Instagram is uh, aged among uh, aged 18 uh, to, to 21 years old same same with my uh, subjects so uh, this is uh, really correlated also the instagram uh, has a lot of feature such as uh, sharing story and then hashtag and also uh, uh, it easier for for me or uh, for an uh, for educator to share an interesting education uh, with a model of infographics maybe or picture so that uh, it can send uh, for all the for all our subjects briefly and also uh, on target i think that's all my answer yeah. Yeah. okay okay uh, okay thank you marika uh, uh mr wisnu has a question uh for brian brian yeah okay <laughs> yeah. thank you uh to Dian. yeah <laughs> um yeah i have a question to brian uh, according to the 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 aims of the research of brian is to assess the vulnerability yeah, of the flood events in the central Java province. I think <clears throat> um, due to the study area that covers all of the cities and regencies in central Java, um, it would be better if Brianna could um, divide or could categorize uh, the study area into several, um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, several categories before because uh, I think um, uh, they have uh, different spatial characteristics, uh, different socioeconomic characteristics, yeah, and as well as I think uh, due to the land use change or land use, um, um, yeah, I mean uh, the land use itself uh, between the north coast of Central Java and the south coast and Central of Central Java, as well as in the inland area of the Province, yeah. So I think it is. Um, it should be, um, yeah, should be different or should be distinguished, yeah. So uh, with regard to spatial characteristics, socio-economic characteristic, or um, land use pattern, and as well as the population density, yeah. So um, um, in the end, we can, um, yeah, the research uh, can be. Uh, can can come to to the findings uh, and can identify um, the level of vulnerability. Yeah. So because uh, I read that one of the aims of the research or one of the goals of the research is um, yeah to find out uh, the level of vulnerability or to 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 find or to examine. Um, which community uh, become the most vulnerable uh, groups or become the most vulnerable um, um, part of people. Yeah, so I think we have to, I, I mean, uh, it would be better if we can um, identify the level of vulnerability among the people or among the community in Central Java province. Yeah, with regard to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the different spatial characteristics different socioeconomic characteristic, different land use pattern, and uh, as well as the uh, population density. Yeah, that is my, it is not, maybe it is not actually a, a question, but on the input or feedbacks to uh, Priyana. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes, yeah. thank you so much for that issue. I absolutely 100% agree. Um, this is sort of the first uh, step in this uh, analysis and um, challenges finding data can be disaggregated below the district level. Um, but that's something that we're working on. I think using the Indonesian Family Life Survey, uh, we can get some finer level of disaggregation. And also using the Copernicus data, uh, remote sensing data, we can look at exposures that are very much disaggregated in both space and time. Um, so that's definitely the next step. Um, and yes, that's a very, very good, important point that you raise in 100% uh, I and absolutely recognize the importance of, <laughs> of getting a more finer, <laughs> finer spatial granularity. So that's something that we're work on, working on. Um, I'm currently in the phase of sort of developing my dissertation aims for my thesis research. Um, and so that's, I think that's something that I'll be working on in the next year. Okay, thank you. good luck. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Vishnu, and thank you, Brian. <laughs> well, uh, before we continue to the third uh, third part of uh, this station, uh, maybe uh, I will uh, announce the best presenter <laughs> because uh, after this, uh, maybe uh, we we have uh, in-depth uh, discussion, yeah, to increase collaboration and maybe yeah, uh, maybe some mentor will ask. Uh, uh, a lot of question to the students. Uh, well, the committee, uh, are you ready to announce the best presenter? Congratulations to Ryan B. Simpson. <laughs> Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, before we move to the next session, maybe we can uh, take a picture together, maybe. Uh, who will take picture? Committee? Uh, and all, all, all participants, yeah, please, please uh, yeah, turn on the, the video, the camera. Video. Mrs. Rika will uh, save the picture. Mrs. Rika, can you yes. uh, guide us? Guide us how to do the picture, smile, or maybe with thumbs, or whatever <laughs> you wanted to do <laughs> with us. <laughs> okay, uh... I will count one, two, three, and give your best smile. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay, uh, okay, uh, once more. Okay, once, once more. more. One, two, three, with the thumbs. Smile. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, th thank you, Miss Rika. Yeah, uh, maybe we can directly move to the okay, last mohon diulang, Prof. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> mohon diulang, Prof. Yeah, yeah, mohon diulang, Prof. Prof. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Mrs. Rika, can you turn on the video? Yeah, for the last session, yeah. maybe uh, Professor Elena or uh, Mr. Uh, Aris will lead this session and uh, for the all participants uh, is it okay uh, if you can join uh, for this session okay thank you mrs diana yeah. so uh congratulations to ryan as the best presenter <laughs> we yeah so it's part of our uh, program to 
to give uh, the best presenter in each classes. Uh, so you're the last person to this uh, best presenter in overall of this occasion. So congratulations one more time. And uh, I would like to uh, discuss also with uh, Professor Elena, uh, how would we start this uh, session and for all the participants, uh, you are very welcome to join this uh, in-depth session and um, uh, feel free to give uh, questions to all the PhD students and all the students from the TAF because they really need your input related uh, to their research uh, because uh, because of this pandemic, uh, they, they cannot uh, go to Indonesia. So it's very hard for them just to uh, visualize, not to uh, get through to the field, and, and yeah, it's they need uh, our uh, experience and our uh, um, and our uh, knowledge uh, related to uh, their research. Uh, so please, Elena, uh, you can uh, unmute uh, Burika. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this special session and I'm really very happy to see it a uh, very high turnout and uh, a good and uh, very insightful questions from the audience. So I, I believe it would be extremely important for us to, to understand that, yes, without really building a, a strong collaboration, it's really very difficult to do it uh, just plainly using the existing data set. Uh, in my plenary talk, I try to strengthen in the issue that um, on the one hand, it's extremely valuable for us to, to, to basically train a new generation of students and experts in this area to, to recognize the value of uh, a public, uh, public data sets. So with these public data sets, you know, there is always pros and cons. On the one hand, uh, we have uh, access to a variety of very important data sources. And the data sources become available to a big range of experts in a different field. On the other hand, the individual experience of collecting this information or specifics of collecting information, and even more importantly, interpretation of data in those data sets are remain uh, very difficult to tackle without really in-depth understanding and in-depth expertise. So it would be extremely valuable for us to continue conversation and on the one hand, um, have a chance to ask questions from the mentorship committee from UNDIP to students for further cl clarification, but also for us uh, to uh, have a chance for students to ask questions to initiate this discussion. I hope that it will be only our first dialogue um, and uh, what the plan would be is to devise a format in which we will be able to do it on a regular basis, create a more formal structure and move forward with uh, not only with a presentation, but for in establishing uh, uh, collaborative groups, which extremely important to do it, especially in a time when the actual travel is not feasible for, for a, a nearest future. We also probably need to think about how to establish sort of uh, rules of engagement, especially when we work on international settings and in remote settings. So the way of how we communicate, how we exchange idea, how we help each other to develop the idea is a, a new area. It's a new normal for us to learn how to do it remotely. Um, I'm very impressed with the organization of the conference and I believe that this experience would be extremely helpful for us to move in this direction. So this is my a small introductory component, um, design a set of questions, and I will probably ask uh, Jan and um, Dave, Ryan, Liz, and, and Taylor uh, to think about the questions, what you have for the experts and if uh, maybe what who to start a discussion and also to, um, to provide an exchange situation where the experts from Deep University will uh, ask questions to uh, to the team members and also to see how we can advance this discussion on the stage. Okay, 
So maybe we can start with the set questions um, unless you have a special suggestion. So my comments are going and questions are going in terms of format to Iris, to Anin, and to Dr. Ambrianto. If any comments, suggestions you have. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, maybe before um, we start with the question, maybe I, I wanted to introduce you with uh, some new um, experts because uh, in the, our first meeting, uh, they cannot come and now uh, they have time to join with us. So I will introduce you with uh, the first one is Mrs. Diana. So Mrs. Diana is uh, the expert in um, nutritious also so i think elena is already known her before yeah. and yeah and it's student uh she's uh she's one of the best in undip in related to the nutritious and the next one is uh mr muhammad helmi so he's the we can call him as the god of the gis uh, so he's very <laughs> he's very expert in gis and <laughs> Fahelmi is a uh, yeah he's and he is one of the favorite mentor in every student that come to Undip uh, because he ha he is very clear in explanation and and yeah and but he is very very busy <laughs> so <laughs> you have to manage your time with him and the next one is uh, Professor Denny so Professor Denny on our last meeting uh, I think. Uh, he came uh, uh, not too long because he has uh, another meeting at that time. So I will introduce him also, Professor Denny. Uh, so uh, Professor Denny is the expert uh, related to the coastal engineer and then tidal flood also because um, he's, he's, uh, he's making a, what we call it, a application related to the tidal flood. So if uh, there are going to be a tidal flood. You can see on, on the apps and the people on the location uh, can uh, migrate to other places that, that are uh, safe. Yeah, uh, that's one of the projects uh, from uh, Professor Denny. So I think, uh, and we also have uh, Professor Ambar in, in this session. Uh, uh, hello, Professor Ambar and Professor Ratno. So uh, on our first meeting, we haven't uh, met, met him and her. So uh, at today's session, it's an honor for us uh, in their busy time, they can join us. So yes, um, maybe uh, that's uh, all of the new uh, experts that came and we already have Pak Wisnu at the first meeting. Pak Wisnu also came and yeah, and also me maybe, <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, pa Anin cannot join us uh, fully because uh, he has some uh, really uh, what do you call it? Uh, we had uh, today is uh, Islamic day for uh, Maulid uh, the Prophet Muhammad. So yeah, he's he joined uh, the the preparation for tomorrow um, event. So he says uh, very sorry, cannot join fully in this session, Elena. Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe for the first uh, uh, first session, if uh, one of our mentor can ask one of your student uh, much more deeply, maybe is is that okay with this? Uh, and while we have some discussion, maybe if the student wanted to ask back one of our experts, yeah. So it, we will have uh, some fruitful discussion and interactive and also uh, effective. Absolutely. So we can start. That's a, yeah, it's a we good can start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. We can start. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can start. So uh, for the mentors, uh, are there uh, anyone who volunteer to ask or clarify uh, all of one of the students? Uh, that that you wanted to ask or give some inputs uh, from the presentation they that they already done. Yes, thank you, Paris. Yes, yes, um, yes, uh, Professor Elena and uh, Professor Rambar, also Professor No. Good afternoon. 
uh, good evening ya yeah? no evening in indonesia and good morning everybody in uh, uh, us uh, uh, what i would like to say is only to strengthen that uh, because of the covid uh, pandemic in indonesia especially in central java or uh, semarang no local government uh, has changed uh, communicate their communication system almost of the uh, institution local institution no have their own something like a teleconference teleconference mean they have a zoom meeting they have a, a more familiar to using a, a microsoft teams and so on because uh, their daily meeting now is done in uh, using a, 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 what do you call that a, a online meeting before they have not like that they have no experience and very hard for us to asking them to preparing using uh, zoom for example or using skype meeting that is very difficult but no they have already prepared in almost department and also a local agency have their fa that uh, facilities because uh, all, almost of their meeting is done in uh, online meeting so what is the benefit for us because because of the different uh, uh, distance between boston and central java or semarang but no uh, we in in our university and also in local government facilities they already provide the system that make us more easier to make a communication so i think uh, this is a good uh, uh, opportunity for us especially for you the student uh, to uh, access them so we are in in uh, uh, semarang can uh, uh, inform to the local government using a uh, uh, undip invitation for example or using ICZM invitation or korem invitation to the, to the local government so uh, self for local government or agency uh, like uh, public work uh, uh, what do you call that uh, marine and fisheries or spatial planning and many other agency can uh, uh, join in our meeting so you can ask many thing related to your research you can present your uh, 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 what do you call that uh, uh, research to them and after that they can give a comment they can inform you of the data and so on because uh, there are many uh, data actually that already have by the local government and uh, especially for uh, elizabeth yeah, they have a very uh, a complete information related to what you need or maybe uh, you can uh, what do you call that uh, something like uh, asking uh, uh, something important like uh, budgeting and the resilience of the city I think they they will uh, 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 happy to answer your question. Uh, that is uh, Profaris. That is only to inform to the student and uh, us about that uh, facilities facilities that already uh, provide in the local government. Thank you, Paris. Okay, thank you, Pa Helmi, for your input. It was a great input. Um, maybe. Uh, Uh, one of us has the link to the uh, the agency maybe or something maybe we can help the students or maybe, yeah maybe we can find some um, what do you call it? some bridges to bridge between the staff student and the government or the stakeholder that they want yeah. to assess right right yeah. because uh, Undip has a very good relation with the local government. Yeah? Especially we have now the ICZM center. Aris is the director on that center. So we have a better relationship, especially with Central Java government. So uh, they, uh, in, in, uh, we have a, a center of office, local government many times come to our office also. And they are also invite us to 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 join in with uh, their meeting for example 
uh, that is a good, uh, now we have a very good uh, relationship with the local government. Mm -hmm. So this is a good time for you to access the information from them. Thank, thank you, you Ari. Yeah, thank you, Ari. Do you have any I, comment, Lena? I actually have. Uh, uh, I'm really very thankful for the session. I believe it's extremely valuable. You know, from our personal experience, when you just have a cold call to the government by a student or even by faculty from international organizations, usually not really very well received. So I believe that it should be a proper introduction uh, from the UNDIP. Um, so building the relationship in a way that, you know, that uh, students or a team member will be properly introduced to, to the officials. Uh, we probably need to come up with a very clear rule of engagement. You probably notice that we have a requirement for students to provide acknowledgement sections to every single uh, communication. So we will be relying on you in um, in providing proper credits, but appropriate and fair credits to people who are involved in suggesting information, providing information, and building this type of connections as well. So it, it since it's now really very easy to lost information somewhere, probably we need to have again establish a system for exchange of communication, reporting and collecting data in a written form as well with um, maybe recording. So we will have a, a better record of um, what was what kind of information was provided. So we can go back and reevaluate and then examine if something was missing during this conversation due to technical difficulties with internet or with a language issue or with a sound quality. So that would really help us to build the uh, a stronger um, sort of more resilient system for communication okay yeah uh, yeah we will yeah yeah okay please uh, this. yes prof number yeah welcome prof number yeah good evening hey, good please. morning uh, prof Elena, and uh, good morning everyone Good evening from those from Indonesia. What I was going to say actually, it's uh, quite similar to what Pa Elmi has mentioned before. Uh, following the presentation of everyone, it seems to me that uh, everyone uh, needs more data for completing their works and their uh, thesis or papers or whatever from our local government. Uh, for example, uh, Ren need uh, to do, uh, he suggests, he suggested that we need to do ground check, for example. Uh, and also uh, others, maybe they need more data and what we can do, uh, apart from what Helmi already mentioned, I think whenever you, uh, we need a list from each of you, what kind of data that you need from where, from which district or city, because we have 35 districts or cities in Central Java, uh, or do you need from, the coast area only or also those district or city within the middle of the, uh, the province. Uh, we need the list of that and also we also need the uh, proposal uh, as the base of uh, for us to actually ask the local government uh, because the uh, late, later on, the uh, UNDIP will ask the data based on the proposal. So we need the proposal and also we need also uh, when do you need the data. As we know that we are uh, in, uh, in the time of ending year of 2020, which usually we are very busy doing all the reports, uh, uh, yearly reports, financial reports, and so on and so on. So 
I hope that you do not need by this year. Uh, it's I, I think I don't know. I think it's going to be difficult unless the data that you need is not many. So the first step that you need to do is make kind of list each of you what kind of data that you need from which district or cities and then we can try to send a letter to the uh, right office or uh, right bureau for example to get the data and we are going to attach the proposal that uh, you sent to us and hopefully we can get the data that you need to complete your uh, research and uh, to finish your thesis or papers, for example. Uh, uh, I have uh, uh, not a question, but for Taylor, uh, you mentioned in your uh, conclusion that uh, regarding the policy, Samarang city policy, it's uh, has been very good. I think uh, we need more than that. We need uh, your input. What actually need to be done more in Samarang rather than saying it's uh, it's a good uh, policy, but we need so that we can use this to suggest to uh, the the major or uh, vice major of Samarang, which is uh, ex-student main, they are a uh, student of Tibonokoro University. So we can ask them uh, uh, directly if we have any suggestion in regard to the uh, topics that you do. And for uh, David, uh, do you actually uh, looking uh, at the mangroves, the plantation as well, or uh, any mangrove, either replantation or natural mangrove? Because every year there are many agencies, uh, either government agencies or uh, NGOs or universities have uh, replanting programs uh, in the coastal area for mangroves. So I don't know whether you need to have this kind of data or you just uh, looking at the map and uh, just looking as mangrove uh, without considering whether it's natural or uh, replantation program. And for, uh, I'm sorry if I may misspelling, Talopa, you mentioned about the uh, Indonesia is in the second uh, largest uh, plastic waste producer after China as we all know. And I think uh, the data after pandemic, actually, as you all know that the food order uh, by, for example, in Indonesia, we know go food and so on and so on, it's increasing significantly. So uh, the information from the city uh, with management uh, said that the number of the the amount of the uh, plastics and styrofoam waste is increasing like 30 percent right now so it's quite a uh, high number because of the pandemic I mean, uh, people don't want to go outside they just ordered by their smartphone so that part might be can be used as uh, uh, what your discussion might be. Uh, uh, 
uh, that's all I can say right now. Uh, again, please list what you know and the data you need, every one of you, and then send us the proposal and hopefully you don't need by the end of this year because the end of this year is usually very busy for uh, provincial, local, or even in the university, we usually have to prepare all the reports, especially financial report, uh, yearly uh, annual financial report. Thank you, Elena, and everyone, Pak Ares, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Professor much. Ambar. Thank you. Yeah, maybe Elena, you wanted to have some comment? No, I think it's really very valuable suggestions and some data maybe we will uh, need a bit earlier, but maybe they are much easier to get. But in terms of understanding uh, what is, a, you know, how did somebody from uh, the UNDIP side and expert in the area could say, you know, how difficult or how complex it might be. And maybe for some project, um, you know, the, it can wait. Uh, definitely, unfortunately, our grant is have a, a limiting factor as well. And we need to make yeah. sure that we will be able to complete the grant by the time when the funding is over and support is over. So, you know, both competing interests need to be weighted properly. Um, understanding that how busy you are and understanding that there is a deadline as well. Um, so I, I think it's really very valuable for us to think through this direction and thank you for that suggestions. I believe now you have all the uh, abstract for the, for, for the projects. Uh, we can extend the abstracts into the proposal. So it's basically given uh, an idea why and rational it will be provided, why this data is needed and how they will be used. So this proposal have a very clear sense to implement. And maybe not all the students will require data uh, immediately or at the different stages. So we will wait very carefully the consideration, come up with a draft proposal and send it over to you. One thing that I, I forgot to mention is that in proposal, please put uh, uh, what do you call it? The benefit of the local government if this research is done and the result uh, can be sent to them and they will get the benefit uh, for the future policy, for example. Yeah, that's really very good issue. And sometimes uh, the benefits of the specific policies are maybe more visible on your side rather than to our side, um, since we don't have uh, and don't live in experience as you are. Mm -hmm. So any comments and suggestions from the expert panel and from the mentorship committee would be extremely helpful. Sure. Mm -hmm. Are there okay. any questions? Okay, are there any specific question? Maybe Pak Wisnu, uh, do you want to have some in-depth uh, clarification, Pak Wisnu? Yeah, no, Pak Aris, I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's all from me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And I look forward to uh, for the discussion, uh, especially with with uh, Priyan. Maybe if uh, there is some uh, progress on. Uh, her work about what kind of data yeah that, that can yeah as Pa Ambar said that uh, we need to uh, we need for a list of data long list or short list of data and we can link with uh, particular institutions here in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, thank that's you, it. Vishnu. Maybe uh uh, from the student side, do you want to uh, ask something or clarify or, yeah, do you want to have some comment maybe from the students? Um, or I can, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I think we're sort of at the very early stages of, of this research, um, at least I am, and so I think what would really 
be beneficial for me is to have you involved in every aspect of it moving forward because um you know i i i really want to hear from you what aspects of vulnerability are most important and so i'm i'm learning as i go along and i'm, I'm learning a lot from the literature and, and what i'm reading but i don't have the strong contextual knowledge so i could really benefit from having um, your input in this vulnerability metric and just your expert expertise in the variables and information and types of data that are most important to to include. So I, I would definitely be happy to um, share my progress as I go along and also receive your input. Okay, yeah. thank you, Brian. Yeah. Uh, and we already had uh, the box that you have uh, provided, Brian. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, some of us, uh, it's still new for us, so, so some, some of us cannot access it yet. Uh, we still need some, um, what do you call it, some tutorial, but I, I managed to have the box uh, and I will try to uh, transfer my knowledge to all my colleagues related to uh, to get this data from the box that you have uh, already um, given to us. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We also, okay, please, we also can create in a box a specific topic. So it will be much easier to collect. And um, sometimes we only have access to literature, what we are able to find based on the major key searches or uh, following the um, basically a track of information within the literature. But it might be not a, a full literature list yeah. and maybe not, not highly specialized. Plus, sometimes without this contextual knowledge, we don't know for sure what is the quality of publications. So um, ability to share the publications yeah. in this box on by topic and by expert. Some of the literature is absolutely out of access for right. us yeah. when it comes to the local journals or literature you know the best. At the same time, we can help also with a, a major literature we have a collection on, and that could provide a really change of information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I was um, mentioned that um, to access this box, many of us uh, are not uh, well known. You know, so uh, the technology is uh, is still new for us. So yeah, I need to transfer uh, this knowledge uh, related to the how to. Uh, to get the data from the box. I, I will have some um, uh, coordination with our inner internal team, uh, yeah. Elena. Yeah. yeah. And we, will, yeah. we will do the test inside. We will try to see what is working and what is not yeah. working and yeah. ad identify the best way. For TAFs, we need to have a special permission to give. So we need to know the list of yeah. people who will have access to yeah. this website. Yeah. I understand, yeah, yeah, and yeah, because uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Pak Rudy, uh, I think he cannot come to this uh, session because uh, he has another meeting and he said he's very sorry and yeah, he, he was trying to access it and he said uh, it's quite difficult and yeah, I will, I will, I will uh, help him to, to access the data. Exactly, and we also need to yeah. know what is your difficulties on your side so we can yeah. be more proactive and more yeah. look targeted in, in our yeah. help so not, it will be more uh, specific yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. we we could also try different formats we don't have to use box if there's a better um better format that works for everyone yeah. okay yeah maybe yeah maybe we can uh, talk it later in the um in the email or yeah in the group email yeah Okay, uh, maybe for the next, uh, uh, are there any uh, comments? Maybe Professor Denny, do you want to have some um, comment for uh, this session? Yes, uh, enough, Pak Aris. Maybe I have to uh, discuss with Pak Elmi about uh, my research uh, deadline tonight. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you, Pak Aris. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Professor Denny. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe uh any students wanted to have some comments because uh if yes you, you can have uh, some comments or yeah please it's time for the students 
I would just like to say thank you to Dr. Ambariento. So um, yes, I would be interested in looking at the uh, mangrove replanting and regeneration activities that are being done in Semarang City and uh, surrounding areas. And I think uh, we will have a chance to discuss that more after we prepare the proposal and submit the list of data that we need. Um, but I had begun, like Brian like Bri had, had mentioned, um, our research is still in the beginning phases. And before this presentation, I had begun to look at some of the information about replanting of mangroves. And I think it's very interesting. So I would like to highlight that in this research program as well. So thank you for um, mentioning that. Okay, David, uh, maybe I can give you some uh, suggestion also related to the mangrove, uh, the, the mock um, research place. Because um, uh, for the last three or four years, have uh, some PhD students, uh, as I mentioned you before at, at our first meeting, uh, they came from the the Netherlands uh, with TU Delft. So they just uh, finished, uh, almost finished their PhD, uh, and they just also have a session in in the earlier uh, in the earlier class at 1 p.m. But uh, we will try to uh, what uh, we'll pub publish it in the YouTube so you can access uh, the, the discussion also. But uh, if you wanted to know more, uh, you can also access their website. Uh, it's called biomanco.org. I will uh, type it on the chat. Okay. So there are a lot of um, issues related to the, the mark and I can uh, connect you with the PhD student because uh, all of them are my uh, yeah are my colleagues also so I can connect you with them and um, related to the mangrove uh, they uh, there are one person who is uh, 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 interested in also in the mangrove for, for her research so yeah I can manage you to have a, a quick insight uh, so because uh, as all you say that this is uh, just a first step so. Yeah, I think it's uh, it will be a good uh, a good a good step uh, for you guys to to know uh, what uh, what type uh, what kind of uh, problems that, uh, that there are in the, in the mark art also. Yeah, because uh, okay, thank you. Main research in in the mark. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would like to follow up on Dr. Brian Abria. And to, sorry for the pronunciation of Dr. Abrianto's comment on my presentation. Um, thank you so much for um, you know, noting that the issue of waste management is even becoming more, more serious. And um, as I indicated in my presentation, a very critical component of my dissertation work will be the formative research that will help me to get a broader view in addition to um, the results I get from analyzing the Indonesian family life survey. Um, the key component will be the formative research that will compose of um, conducting key informant interviews with key stakeholders and experts in different fields. And so um, talking about data availability, I wanted to also think about access to qualitative data, um, key informants and experts that um, can um, meaningfully address some of these um, topics on um, environmental pollution and the impact on health and um, food quality. So I'll be very much interested in knowing more about who I can reach out to, to that. Thank you. Thank you, Dolopa. Dolapo. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Amber, do you want to have some added comment? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I wanted to ask Dolapo. Dolapo, have you heard uh, Go Food or Grab Food before? Uh, are you uh, familiar with this? Um, am I familiar with what? I didn't get that. Uh, GoFood. 
uh, like what uh, Pak Amber said, go food or uh, grab food. So uh, go food or uh, grab food is an application like Uber, but okay. uh, Uber Uber that send just send food to to all the citizen of in Indonesia. So if you came here, many uh, if you came here or the student came here, they will use uh, go food or uh, this application because it's very easy for them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's an application. So you can just choose your food from the app, the smartphone, and then they will send it in front of your room. Yeah, that's okay. that's uh, that's that's why uh, because of uh, the easy technology. But at the end, it it bring us uh, a lot of problem related related to the. Uh, plastics issues. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I want to ask another really very interesting questions in this regard. When you mentioned that now the the increase in using Go Food is dramatically changing during the pandemic, you know, do you think that the data uh, will be possible to share and to find data on Go Food? Uh, because of, it will be known how many different orders of what kind of food was delivered in different locations and different regions. And it will be possible to estimate the caloric profile, the fat content, um, and maybe some other very important ingredients. So this could be a completely separate piece of analysis, which basically would be quite innovative. And then I didn't really see much of a literature how it's changed the profile of nutrition change, especially using this type of services. Um, so if, if, if it would be possible to find information of how to extract it, I think this would be absolutely invaluable resource of information. Okay, yeah. Professor Amber or Mrs. Yeah, Tia, yeah. do you want to comment? Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, Amber first. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Irena, uh, I know the management of uh, GoFood is under Gojek uh, uh, mm -hmm. Central. I, I know people from Central Java Gojek, and because we were going to have a collaboration between our university and with them, and we have been discussing a lot of things. Uh, but in regard to the quality of food that have been ordered by community, I don't know whether they have the data for that uh, because uh, every uh, person order in every different place and, uh, and the food that they are sending, they don't have, what do you call this, this the, uh, what do you call food, Budiana, the uh, number of calorie or whatever it's oh, called. Oh yeah, uh, uh, nutrition fact. It doesn't fact, yeah. Yeah. The, they they just order, for example, they just order nasi goreng. That's all. With yeah. chicken, <laughs> chicken, and mm -hmm. we don't know uh, uh, the the trend whether, but surely the uh, the the trend is the order more uh, kind of fast food rather than traditional food. More like fried chicken or uh, burger, pizza burger, or yeah. burger rather burger. than yeah. Indonesian food like uh, pecel, which is pecel. <laughs> gado, gado. it's uh, less, I, I'm sure that it's less order rather than comparing with pizza or many other Western form of food. So I'm yeah. not sure whether we can get the data for it. I think that uh, since it's all order done through the electronic tracks, you know, information about what was ordered because of it's usually at the point in the in the menu. So that probably will be still recorded by the system itself. The conversion of this item into the caloric intake or fat intake is a separate story and, and will be not done by GoJack, but it should be done internally by researchers and probably the quality would be not really very high in terms of estimation mm. but a proxy even like to to say that you know that now it's really a strong expansion of the western diet and a fast food and it would be noticeable during the pandemic mm. maybe what, what we can do is contact the 
Gucci office and trying to find mm-hmm. out which restaurant is the most uh, favorite, the, the, yeah. the most favorite the, yeah. the most favorite yeah. restaurant <laughs> most favorite yeah and then <laughs> asking which food is the the most ordered food for example <laughs> compared with others yeah. i don't know yeah some, uh, sometimes i think uh, in our uh, application or in our account uh, they will uh, display uh, most most of uh, most favorite menu or maybe uh, uh, for the re- recommended yeah, recommended, recommended. <laughs> food yeah. yeah but sometimes uh, maybe, it's not uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> or maybe we can we can analyze with different approach maybe uh, we can use uh, observation research uh, or we can collect a uh, respondent and then uh, we can analyze maybe uh, uh, how uh, how many or the frequency uh, uh, they they order uh, food uh, using application maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, can I say something, uh, Pak Aris? Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Ramdas. Sure. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, This afternoon, I was moderating a, a webinar series from the Nutrition and Food and Nutrition Society of Indonesia, and they talk about uh, organic uh, food. And uh, uh, they say that there is a tendency that people are more uh, health conscious because of the COVID. And so there is an increase in the deep organic foods. So instead of, uh, well, there is a way, like uh, Prof. Amber said, that we can try to obtain data from the center of Gojek if Undip has a MOU. But there is another way of uh, trying to obtain it, is from trade. Uh, what is the highest uh, purchase of uh, food from materials? Because that is what is being consumed uh, by uh, being used uh, by the restaurant, wherever the restaurant is, whether they are uh, in a Gojek system or not. Uh, that will give a wider uh, perspective, not only those who purchase from direct by application but also in the households mm-hmm. i think that's what i think yeah thank you mm-hmm. that's very very helpful mm-hmm. absolutely and, and and it also depends on uh, education or maybe it can depends on the social economical status of how people prefer to choose what kind of food with respect to affordability availability and other factors and that could be all really very important aspects to, to, to consider. Thank you. Yeah. So if we have the list of what uh, I noticed, uh, who is working on the COVID-19 uh, uh, incidents or occurrence? It's me. Hi. Uh, is your name? Where is it? I'm Ryan. Hi. Ryan Simpson. Thank uh, you. Yes, yes, Ryan. Uh, I was uh, uh, I was going to ask you how do you access uh, uh, the data regarding this uh, uh, number of cases uh, in each city? Uh, with uh, how do you access it by googling or by what? Uh, and what what are the data that is missing? That I I wasn't so clear because yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yes. Already, yeah. Maybe if uh, you can make a list, then somehow I can see where, uh, you know, to put some suggestions. Absolutely, yeah. So on the uh, the chat, I just included the website. And actually, I just I can quickly uh, just share my screen to show. But this is the, the Java Tengwa uh, province data uh, that I have been using. And it actually has, um, I, maybe I have to reset the page here, but um, it does provide some information on uh, individuals who have been, again, treated, who are confirmed, who are uh, treated, who are, I guess I'll keep it in Indonesian, um, 
and provides a, a basic map, but it doesn't actually provide any of the JS coordinates of any of these uh, cases that have occurred. Um, and it does so for the entire province, but then within uh, the actual website, if we go to, to link, it provides a link to each of the different regencies and each of the different CODAs um, and where the specific COVID-19 data is. So I've been going through these links mm. one by one, uh, attempting to find the data, uh, but in many cases, the data is uh, not actually presented as a time series, yeah. but instead presented as, um, if I can come back here, I'm back. scroll down. It's yeah, it's typically presented in a tabular format that's just uh, cumulative totals. So yeah. the cumulative totals prevent being able to, to do an actual time series. So what yeah. I've had to do is try to find these sorts of graphics and then essentially go through and run my cursor very slowly from day to day and to find out exactly what uh, the different counts are that we have, which again, it's, it's possible to be able to find counts but then the whole idea is to be able to actually compare. We have to do rate calculations. And unfortunately, the population data set is something that I've had trouble finding to be able to standardize rates per uh, regency or per quota. So that's just a general idea of, of the work that I'm going through right now and, and the data mining process. And it's, it's gone slightly slow because uh, there's a bit of translation that has to occur uh, at each new page I go to. So it's, it's taking a little uh, bit longer than, than yeah. expected. Yeah, maybe somehow, um, um, you know, with the translation is easier if, uh, yeah, someone uh, here can, you know, just read and then, oh, and summarize it, yeah. So there, there needs to be a you know, FaceTime, you know, one to one or one to two, you know, to go through what uh, the difficulties is. So. That would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So what I could do is I could go to each website, and I guess at each website, if I run into to troubles, I can list exactly where I ran into troubles, right. yeah. provide the link to that website, and then we could maybe isolate exactly how to extract um, the data. And again, if if there is a different repository that folks know of. Um, that has time series data. I mean, I'm I'm more than happy to, to go to whatever resources available. I just I went with what was provided uh, by colleagues that I had spoken with oh, right. um, earlier this yeah. semester. Yeah, it's a time series that I'm missing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ratna. Uh, uh, anyone else uh, wanted to have? Um, comment maybe uh, before I continue because the time is uh, it's already in 2034 and it's been a long day for us <laughs> yeah uh, maybe I can give you uh, maybe one more one more question for for the students maybe is that okay Elena yeah absolutely and Probably I, I need to clarify in terms of how the information from COVID is coming through. So just only give you a little bit of a broader overview. Uh, we just received a grant of $100 million from the USDA um, to study spillover effect and basically modeling of um, infectious outbreak and learning how we can harmonize data across the world um, for uh, disasters like COVID and trying to prevent those type of disasters. It's a very big organization. Um, it's actually covering the um, very seriously African continent, but also uh, the Indonesian, uh, Indonesia is also part of the consortium as a, um, as a representative of the Asian bloc. So we currently working with a professor Viku Adisam Adesso um, Mito, uh, who is a lead or chairman of the expert team on COVID for Indonesia. So we basically have that direct contact. He linked us to uh, Dr. Uh, Agus Suvandono, um, and he mentioned that he has also really very strong connections with the UNDIP. So that's basically how that contacts are established. Um, it's uh, from the higher-ups built on our previous experience of working on um, 
uh, on the modeling and forecasting of infectious outbreaks and building facilities throughout the world uh, for testing the emerging infection. So that's how the collaboration link starts. Uh, and now we are uh, suggested to put also a very detailed data plan, exactly the same way how Dr. Ambriante discussed in terms of what exactly the data we need and we will continue to pursue this route. But we need to provide a very clear protocol in terms of how this data need to be accessed, how they need to be compiled, uh, because of it's a more of a standard protocol um, following the WHO uh, requirements and guidance. So this is a little bit of a separate issue. So, um, and, and then maybe it's a different um, sort of like venues and capacity. So I want, want to be also diplomatically savvy and clear uh, in terms of the responsibilities on multiple sides, uh, just only to keep it aside. Uh, but thank you very much for suggestions and it's extremely valid point how it, that those type of connections have been established. I just maybe like I, I understand the time and I'm so thankful that you are patient and at the end of the day, um, just only in a closing uh, component of that, um, I am planning to uh, set up uh, a special issue for the International uh, Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, uh, where I'm a serving in advisory um, editorial board. Um, I'm very thankful to Dr. Mbariata to agree to be a co-editor on this special issue. Uh, we put together a proposal, so I'm waiting for the comments and suggestions. We are in a very early stage of designing this proposal and making works for the whole entire team. The final um, sort of like our idea is that the, the studies which you hear today in the presentations would be part of this special issue. I am very much open to see a publications from Indonesia overall, not only from UNDIP, but even maybe a broader because of it. it is an international journal and would be welcoming and I will extend the invitation to consider coastal communities and eco-health of a coastal community, especially how they were affected lately, you know, from very broad range of collaborators. We have a long uh, history, in, including our collaborators in Ecuador and Guayaquil, including people from Brazil, including uh, collaborators from Bangladesh. You know, those areas are very heavily affected by floods as well, and they have sharing with us similar type of problems. So um, our timeline will be most likely starts in this January. I hope to complete the special issue by the end of the year. Uh, but it will give a special attention and uh, will be really wonderful if we will be planning to build uh, together with Dr. Mbariato a, a system of that special issue to consider a, a strong expert from multiple, um, from, a re, uh, from a broad research community. And I, I'm thinking about we can put a, a together an editorial uh, which will describe this type of a study the overall view and importance of this research and raise important awareness to the problem of coastal communities. So, and it will raise uh, the status and the statue of UNDIP and Tufts University, of Boston University and other academic partners and governmental organizations which will be helping us in this process. So I am again very thankful and I am looking forward for a very productive collaborations, which I hope will end up with something very practical, which includes special issue recommendation to the government and um, and um, students students research and completion of their masters and PhD thesis, and if possible to have a partners, a student partners from UNDIP, um, so we can work all together because of it's also establishing a new profile of working internationally, collaboratively, remotely, mm -hmm. uh, through mm -hmm. all of these challenges we are going through, I think it's extremely yeah. valuable educational experience as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Elena. Uh, Professor Amber, do you want to have some last comment, maybe? Last comment, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Elena, for the offer. Uh, uh, it's good to know that the special issue will also the paper of special issue will also come from other uh, countries. And is is there any possibility if there is any other uh, scientists from other university in Indonesia who has similar kind of papers that can be submitted to our special issues? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, okay. yes. And we can discuss yeah. it maybe separately, just to think about how the plan look like, how the table of yeah. content look like. And uh, we can actually do a much broader advertisement through uh, different venues as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, I think uh, this is our uh, last session and before I end this session, uh, Professor Amber, uh, I would like to um, give a last speech uh, from our dean. Uh, so we have a closing for this uh, ceremonial in ICT Strat 2020. So this is a part of a, a session from our international conference that uh, it ends on this session. So uh, please. Uh, the operator, can you uh, give us the last uh, remarks uh, from our dean? Mbak Candi? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, yeah. Respect to distinguished speakers, presenter, sponsors, supporter, delegates, professional, and all participants. Praise to be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us the opportunity to organize ICTC Red 2020. I'm very pleased to know that we have finished this two days event splendidly. Moreover, I got report from the committee that all participants have given your best to deliver your abstract, poster and presentation. It is a big pleasure for us to facilitate you in disseminating your wonderful work. I also would like to congratulate the winners of Best Poster and Best Presenter. However, two participants who are not winning the competition will not be discouraged because I believe you also have did your best. Let's continue doing our our wonderful works to help our country to overcome the problem in fisheries and marine ecosystem. As the Dean of Faculty Science, I would like to thank all committee who worked very hard for this past 10 months to prepare the sixth ICTC Red. Without all of you, this international conference would not have been possible. At the end of my speech, I would like to invite all of you to join our next ICTC Red. And let's pray the pandemic will offer very soon, hence we can meet and discuss directly. I do hope you can get a fruitful share with other scientists and build potential collaboration for the future. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, can you uh, stop the video? Candy? My biggest hope is for COVID. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, that's uh, our... Uh, that's the closing pro from our dean. So I would like to say thank you very much uh, to Professor Ambarianto, Professor Rutno for your time and to all of the mentors that uh, have um, spent their time uh, to do this fruitful discussion. And I would like to thanks also for Elena uh, for this collaboration. It's been, 
it's been very great for us so we can have a new collaboration related uh, to our conference also and it uh, it has so many benefits also for us uh, by the student to join to our conference and um, maybe uh, there are still uh, a lot of uh, participants that is still uh, on this session i would like to thanks also uh, mr edward arlene and this is also an opportunity for all of the participants that uh, we have an opportunity to submit a paper in this special issues right elena it's uh, very wide open for all of you so uh, just uh, wait uh, for our next info and uh, for who for you guys uh, that wanted to uh, publish uh, because uh, many of uh, these participants also have uh, their uh, own journal uh, so all of the full abstract uh, we wait until 15 november uh, to be managed by our own peer peer review and that will be managed by uh, pa anin professor amber so pa anin is now is the scientific committee so he will uh, be uh, he will review all of the pa the full paper that uh, has been submitted. So we have. Uh, uh, so I will also report to Professor Amber. Uh, for this year, we have 107 abstracts and 107 participants, and 60% uh, is out from Undip. So this pandemic, uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, we have so many um, uh, participants that is uh, abroad also from the US we have uh, six persons and from the Netherlands we have three or uh, five five uh, participants and then from the Japan we have also one participant so uh, from the participant we have three three till four countries while the keynote is also we have ten keynotes uh, that are also uh, from different countries. So uh, this year, uh, the ICT Threat Conference uh, was held uh, in a fruitful meeting, and we have so many uh, participants related uh, to the country. So our uh, target uh, for UNDIP also to improve the ranking of uh, Dibanagara University. Uh, maybe that's uh, all from my report to you, uh, Professor Amber. And uh, uh, thank you once again to all of the participants. And uh, on behalf of the, I would like to apologize if there are some uh, technical issues or some uh, delivery that is uh, not not good enough uh, from us. So uh, we apologize for this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and see you on the next session. Uh, so this is not the last session. This is just the beginning of the new session uh, for our discussion uh, with all the students from the TAF. Uh, fruitful uh, collaboration in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah. greatly appreciate for your hospitality. Thank you for being such a wonderful host. And we will see uh, soon. And, and yeah. please stay in touch. Very yeah. good. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, bye bye. I hope to see you soon also in Indonesia. Thank you, Elena. Good night, everyone, Thank and good morning you. for you, all of you in the US. Have a nice sleep and rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.